Finally, time to review this 85. Hey guys, my name is John Sparkman. I'm a wedding photographer in Birmingham, UK, and you can find my work at jdsweddings.com. Uh, and it is the end of the wedding season, which means I get to review all the kit I bought this year, tell you what I think of it, give you some honest, honest opinions, because there is so much uh, information to and fro, back and forth about technology online. But I'll give you a real world review. I have done this many pictures with the 85. I have been using it as the second camera body lens. So if you imagine I shoot with the A7 IV, so in the A7 IV, um, on my right hand side at weddings, wedding photographer, remember, <laughs> I have a dual camera strap. So on my right hand side, which is my dominant side, A7 IV, and I typically use either the uh, Sigma 24 or this, which is the Tamron 17 to 28 2.8. Um, and I use that for all the flashes and the main work. On my left-hand side, I have the A7 III, which is the camera I bought before this one, and I only have the 85mm 1.8 by Zeiss on it. I'm going to put this down. The reason why I have two cameras for weddings is multiple fold. It's the reason why I buy cameras which have two SD card slots. There is a, uh, a level of redundancy in there, so if one goes down, I can always continue shooting with the other one. There is range, so if I'm shooting with 2470, I've always got that 85 if I need to get something a bit further away and then I can punch in with a APS-C mode on the camera and I can get even further. That goes beyond the 100mm gap. Uh, another reason I use a zoom and a prime because I want to have that um, either very shallow depth of field for the subject separation. If this doesn't make sense to the majority or some of you, there are courses available on YouTube. Don't need to buy a course for it. Literally just watch some people online. So the subject separation for an 85mm gets me who I need without getting someone behind and in front. That's real nice. And for the last one, for a prime, you've got that low aperture, which means you can shoot in less light. Uh, typically, venues that I shoot at, barns and old houses and manors and castle-esque buildings, sometimes where they do the receptions and the dancing and stuff, there isn't much light. And you can't sometimes set up supplemental lighting such as big old flashes so you've got to use that low aperture number uh, and to be able to shoot in very little light doesn't mean you have to push your ISO up as much which means you can get sharper pictures with less grain. Specifically though this lens and this is the Zeiss it is not a Sony one it is for Sony but it is Zeiss it even says it on the side there Zeiss 85 millimeter 1.8 Batis or Batisse or Batis I don't know Batisse I did an unboxing of this just at the start of the wedding season and I said real good things about its build quality, its style, its optical performance. Um, I was yet to put it through its paces at a wedding, um, but now I've done that. So I can tell you uh, I'm going to cut straight to the point on the biggest thing I found about this, colour cast. There you go, I said it. This produces colours in a different color, cast, temperature, whatever, white balance to my other lenses. My Tamron and my Sigma both uh, produce real neutral or real similar white balances to each other. So when I come to post-production and color matching, um, say I'm shooting a couple pictures here, a couple pictures with a different camera and I'm, I'm switching between them, it's real simple for me when I'm using the other two lenses just to copy and paste white balances. When I'm shooting with this, which I'll be honest, is about a third of every wedding's pictures, whenever I try and copy and paste that white balance, it's wrong. It's slightly off. This comes out a bit more green and yellow than the other two lenses. It's not a major issue, uh, but it does slow down the post-production workflow quite significantly as well. Uh, so that is a time versus, you know, it's a time trade-off essentially. So if you want to do that, that's absolutely fine in the medium distance. So if I'm shooting f1.8 and the person is say 10 foot away, those images are crisp. They were amazing. The subject separation is monumental. It's the reason why I paid a lot extra to have the Zeiss version of the 1.8 versus say the Sony one or the Sigma one or any other 1.8 prime lens. I paid extra to have that image quality and it is flawless. 
But the further away you go, taking photos of people who are 30, 40 foot away, uh, especially at 1.8, you are starting to get blurring, chromatic aberration, real weird around the edges of the subjects. I'll throw some images up on screen in a second. Uh, you get some weird blurring lines. This isn't due to me being shaky on the camera. It isn't due to the camera itself. It is a pure distance versus lens optics scenario. So that's really annoying. And I'll be honest, I have had uh, 70 to 200s, 135s, 105s. I've had loads of different long length primes and zooms. None of them have done that. Even like the first gen uh, Canon 70 to 200 I had about nine years ago didn't do that. Uh, so that is a problem. I don't know if it's just down to my Zeiss. I, I don't know, but it doesn't happen on any other scenarios. So that is something I've looked out for. But in the medium term, the, the half body shots of someone with an 85, crisp. From a personal standpoint as well, the design, it's not for me. Um, I prefer a more um, rugged design. This, this collar here, the, the focusing ring, which only activates manual focus, is slick. Uh, it also feels like it's going to fall off. It hasn't yet, but it feels like it's going to fall off its track because it feels so thin. And that's this just here. So you can see it just there. On top, we have the indicator there. This is the manual focus OLED. So the OLED on top does not engage unless you are on manual focus. So I'm just going to switch to that now. Bear with me if I can remember on this camera how to do it. There we go. So I'm just pressing my autofocus manual focus toggle and you can see it's there and then you can change your manual focus there. This manual focus ring, very, very uh, slick. It doesn't feel like it's geared. It's one of those focus by wire ones. So it only kicks in when the camera tells it to kick in. It's like an additional dial of the camera rather than being a, a geared one direct into your camera. It's pretty normal for Sony's and most mirrorless cameras to be fair. Uh, although the G Master series and all the Fuji film lenses I used to use on my Fuji cameras, that was a the smooth external plume, I guess this is what this is going to be. This, this way it goes in and out. Looks all right. I'm going to pop that off and you can see that it's got this kind of bell shape here. This on top, I'm just going to discard that off now. That is a Moment Cine Bloom filter. Uh, before you say that's not responsible for this weird chromatic aberration that I'm getting at a far away distances, that's a new thing. I'm going to review that shortly. Um, it is nice. It has a T-star coating on the front. That is a sign of a higher end um, anti-reflective coating, which you can get on Zeiss lenses specifically. You've got the Zeiss badge on the side and the blue dot on the side here with a blue, what I would believe, but it might not be, is weather sealing on the back. It's definitely a gasket of some kind, but I can't tell if it's enough to quantify it being a weather sealed lens. The reason why I am doing this review is because a courier comes tomorrow to pick this up and exchange it for a slightly different lens. One with maybe a, a lower aperture, one with some exceptional reviews to it, what purportedly one of the best camera lenses in existence. Uh, and it'll be mine next week. So that is going forward to 2023. I'm very excited about that. I had to give something back in order to, to get this. My mantra of always having a utility zoom on one and then a very good prime on my second body to combat the ISO differences on my two cameras. Is, cameras, is, cameras is such that I require something with a very low aperture. Now being 2022 onto 23, um, some people may argue, why do you need such a low aperture? Why don't you just bump the ISO in the camera? Uh, I can tell you routinely, I shoot at 6,000 to 10,000 ISO at weddings, uh, even with a prime lens. Some places are really dark. Some places you can't put flash in for various reasons, religious reasons, restrictions, uh, etc. Sometimes your bride and groom really wanna shoot there and sometimes you have no other choice but to shoot at ridiculously high ISOs to combat it. It's not the reason why I'm gonna get this magical other lens, uh, but it is one of the contributing factors. That alongside the minimum focusing distance of an 85, this isn't specific to this one, that's just general for all 85s. 85s may be just not for me right now. I have owned the 8514 DGHSM by Sigma back when I had Canons seven or eight years ago. 
super, super slow to focus, did my head in, but when you nailed it and you got the focus, incredible, but it's just not for me. So that's the end of uh, the 85's journey with myself. Been a great lens, perhaps on the more expensive side for uh, a 1.8, but you're not just buying it for its lowest total aperture, you're buying it for the sharpness that it can provide and the, um, the rendition, the blur, the bokeh, the foreground focus. Just be wary, and I don't know if it was mine or it's a general Zeiss thing, just be wary of the colour cast that comes out from the Zeiss. Uh, and when you're white balance matching in post, uh, it can be tricky, especially if you're shooting on something like film or you're doing video. It can get a bit, um, bit hard to adjust that unless you're shooting like a, a log or a raw format. If you like this kind of content, stick around and subscribe. I will see you in a future video.